We've already referred to that a little bit. Uh, NEPA, uh, MMPA, ESA, acronym SOUP. Um, but it's going to be interesting, and uh, Josh Eagle is going to be moderating this panel for us. I've gone over his bio before, but he comes from South Carolina up here, uh, has agreed to take this panel on. So to his left is Donna Christie, and uh, again, in reading people's bios and preparing for this, um, I know that she's, uh, if you don't know her casebook, it's on my shelf in many revisions, and her co-authors are here, and there's a lot of co-authors of casebooks here at this conference. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but we've been thinking a lot about this stuff and cranking out a lot of paper on it uh, that we make law students read, so uh, I guess that's a good thing. Uh, Professor Christie is the Elizabeth C. and Clyde W. Atkinson Professor of Law and Associate Dean for International Programs at the Florida State University College of Law, uh, co-author of a leading casebook in the field as well as uh, numerous articles and reports. Uh, she was also involved in the preparation of an appendix for the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy. She received her JD from the University of Georgia School of Law, attended the Hague Academy of International Law, and also spent a little time as a postdoc up at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution right around the corner. Uh, Steve Ouellette, to her left, uh, has been practicing law out of Gloucester and trying cases in state and federal courts for over 25 years, representing fishermen and small businesses. Uh, he's represented the city of Gloucester in the Northeast Seafood Coalition in the Amendment 13 litigation, and is currently representing Gloucester and New Bedford and other fishing interests along the Mid-Atlantic up to the state of Maine in litigating aspects of Amendment 16 to the ground fish amendment, the ground fish plan that we recently that we heard about earlier. To his left is Dana Wolf. Uh, she's a staff attorney at Ocean Conservancy based in Washington, D.C. She advises them on ocean conservation and fisheries issues, particularly with rep uh, respect to implementation of the Magnuson Stevens Act. She's been with them for six years and has also worked in uh, congressional relationships for that organization. Prior to that, she uh, worked as legislative counsel for the Coast Alliance and also as legislative assistant to former representative Steve Gunderson from Wisconsin. Uh, Dana received her JD from the Dickinson School of Law and her LLM in Environmental Law from the George Washington University. And finally, on, on the far left uh, is our award winner. Well, I don't know. I, I, I think, yeah, you're definitely from farther away than Phil Saunders. So from, from very cold climates, our travel award mi miles winner is Kaya Bricks from Alaska, uh, Director of Protected Resources Division of NOAA Fisheries Alaska Region in Juneau. She's led this program for the past six years, has been with NOAA Fisheries for 15 years. Um, you'll notice an evolution from, uh, as our program progresses, from lots of exclusively lawyers in the early panels to throwing in a few PhD people, a few scientists, to tomorrow where we are going to really mix it up with some economists and some fishermen. Now that wasn't really deliberate when we put this program together, but that's turned out because those are the people who are most qualified to talk about this evolving area of law. And I think it's indicative that it's getting much more complex, interdisciplinary, all that. So uh, Kaya is stepping into the, into the fray as, as is Morgan amongst a lot of lawyers. So, uh, I give you pan panel two, and Donna, I think you're leading us off here. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. I hope you all have been doing what um, I've been doing for the last hour. I've been popping Hershey Kisses trying to get my sugar up so that I wouldn't fall asleep during this panel. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, to, to, to look at some fisheries issues again for the last year or so, I've been kind of up to my ears in sand and oil, so fisheries haven't been my main focus for a little while here. So it's nice to be able to look back on uh, some of these issues that, that I'd been working on earlier. Now, uh, I was first asked to kind of give you an overview since we were talking about the intersection of the Magnuson Act with, uh, with other, other laws, and obviously the MSA doesn't exist in a, in a vacuum, that uh, there are other acts that, that uh, that, that are very integral as far as the fishery management plans and fishery planning. Um, and it also, uh, other kinds of things like uh, the U.S. Constitution, when one, somebody claims that there's a taking of their property because of regulation, 
or international treaties like CITES or the International Whaling Convention or regional fisheries organizations. Uh, these kinds of things uh, also affect our management. But today I'm, I'm going to look at something I looked at uh, earlier um, for the uh, National Ocean Commission, the interplay of the Endangered Species Act and Marine Mammal Protection Act with uh, Magnus and Stevens Act and how that, the, how, how that um, works out with the fact that you have one agency that's in charge of managing uh, all of these different marine living resources and no real guidance as to how to prioritize and deal with these things. So um, the Endangered Species Act, uh, just very quickly, uh, the prohibition on uh, taking of endangered species, uh, the uh, incidental taking uh, is some, somewhat allowed as long as there's a mitigation plan and the takings aren't going to appreciably reduce the likelihood of survival. You know, also have designation of critical habitat for endangered species, preparation of recovery plans, and in the case of federal actions that uh, jeopardize the, the continued existence of an endangered species, uh, biological opinions and consideration of reasonable and prudent alternatives. Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, the moratorium on taking there too, uh, with a number of exceptions and exemptions. Uh, and the Act now provides for a special taking incidental to commercial fishing to reduce mortality and serious injury. Now, when you look at the protected species that NOAA takes care of, the, um, uh, there's quite a few marine species that they're, you're, you're talking about. On the other hand, although it seems like that, that's quite a number, uh, you see that there are 72 ESA listed species uh, that are currently um, listed as endangered or threatened. That's out of about almost 2,000 endangered and listed species. So we only have 72 listed marine species. You take out 30 or so anadromous species, you know, salmon, trout, sturgeon, whatever, you get down to about 42. Um, then you have our, our nice uh, charismatic megafauna uh, that, and uh, marine sea turtles that make up then a large majority of the rest of those. And that doesn't leave much else that, that's covered by the Endangered Species Act as far as the marine environment. So it gives you an idea of how little we know about the marine environment and how little is going on to protect uh, anything but kind of the most obvious impacts on species in the marine environment. Uh, there are 22 uh, mammals that, uh, uh, as far as the Marine Mammal Act, overlapping with the Endangered Species Act, and those are mostly what we'd be concentrating on today. Uh, the kind of interactions that, that are dealt with in these cases, um, bycatch, okay, when you're long-line fisheries, trawl nets, gear entanglements, usually with traps and pots, but also with gill nets and seines, and competition. Uh, we are, um, well, we're both kind of the top of the food chain when we're looking for these, um, for our prey, and we're looking for the same things. And so um, sometimes the competition leads to gear entanglement or bycatch, and sometimes the, the competition leads to basically starving out a species. Um, under the um, MMPA and the ESA uh, recovery plans have to be done in certain circumstances that are set out in the uh, provisions here. And in the case of these recovery plans, though, the recovery, they're not uh, specifically enforceable. And as some critics say, well, you know, the recovery plans don't mean much if they're not enforceable and they're not followed. So uh, these recovery plans haven't always been uh, particularly useful in, in uh, uh, the recovery in the, the marine environment. Okay. The um, MMPA, the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, to give you a little background on the issues around um, the protection of marine mammals and, its, and their incidental take in, in fisheries, it all, of course, started with the tuna dolphin controversy, and it really highlighted the interaction between marine mammals and, and fisheries and great outcry. Uh, response from the, the, the federal government. Uh, but in 1998, a, a case called Kokochik Fishermen's Association versus Secretary of Commerce really brought to the forefront that this is just the, kind of the tip of the iceberg when you're talking about the tuna dolphin controversy, that there's a huge number 
of interactions between uh, marine mammals and fisheries just across the board. And that hadn't been addressed at all, and there was a lot of taking of marine mammals without permits, uh, and there was a, a, a situation where permits couldn't be issued for marine mammals because it wasn't known whether um, what the stocks were and what st uh, status was of those marine mammals. So, in uh, after 1988, which and, and this Kokochik case, which basically could look could have led to complete shutting down of fisheries, uh, there was an interim exemption for fisheries for five years, while there was management uh, information gathered, uh, scientific information, information about the the fisheries that uh, had significant impacts on marine mammals, observer programs being set up stock assessments of, of marine mammals being made. So at the end of that time, the 1994 amendments were passed to the MMPA um, that were uh, an interesting, uh, interesting legislation because it was kind of jointly proposed uh, by fishermen and, and uh, environmental groups. Um, not necessarily all fishermen got, got representation, but, but a significant number of fishermen were involved in development of this. Uh, the MMPA called for stock assessments and setting of what was called the potential biological removal level. Basically, how many can you take uh, from the environment uh, without dropping the populations below what's called optimum sustainable population, which is the, you know, basically the, the uh, concept that marine mammals are managed for rather than maximum sustainable yield. Okay. Um, there, the, uh, there was also a comprehensive program created for uh, minimizing interactions, establishing review groups, <laughs> and regulating fisheries with significant interactions, uh, take reduction teams to develop uh, take reduction plans, short and long-term goals for reducing incidental take. They, uh, Okay, the short, uh, the, the goals for, for reducing were, in a six months, they were supposed to, uh, to reduce mortality and serious injury to below the PBR, and within five years to uh, insignificant levels approaching zero mortality. Okay, so that basically was going to be five years and everything was going to be okay. Um, one of the first steps was, was identifying the fisheries the category one, two, and three fisheries, ones with frequent, occasional, and category three with remote uh, interactions with and injuries with, uh, for marine mammals. It was, it was amazing how much we didn't know. Uh, what we found out after those five years of studies and how much the interaction level, or how high the interaction level was, uh, these categories of one and category one and two fisheries are literally thousands of boats and fishermen. So it's not a, a small handful in particular places. It's a lot of people, a lot of vessels all around the country. The category one and two fisheries have to register uh, with, with NIMPS. They have to report, well, all, all the fisheries have to report uh, any incidental injuries and mortalities. Uh, they are required to take on board observers if, if NIMPS requests. And of course, all of these um, uh, the purpose of all of this is to identify the threats and, and take measures to prevent bycatch. Now, the innovative part of this, well, the most innovative part of this, was the development of the idea of take reduction teams. And for every strategic stock that interacts with a category one or two fishery, a take reduction team is supposed to be established. And um, I won't go through the definition of strategic stock there. You can, can look at that. But these take reduction teams were uh, yeah, quite unique. They're the antithesis of the fishery management councils because they are so inclusive. Uh, they involved fishermen. They, they didn't exclude the fishermen because this was a conservation program. Include fishermen, environmental groups, states, uh, the federal government, the uh, academics, the scientific community. Everybody, so very wide range of representation on these take reduction teams. They would develop their develop take reduction plans on a, a very uh, swift schedule, shall we call it? Uh, and uh, the take reduction uh, plans were to include 
um, a, a number of things here, but usually it's things that are uh, gear regulations, area closures at certain times, other kinds of, of, of things, steps that can be taken to, to deal with the kind of interactions that were coming from um, the, the, the fisheries and the marine mammals. These um, plans were mostly developed by consensus. Uh, when consensus wasn't reached, then, uh, then National Marine Fisheries would still have the obligation to publish a, a plan and, and would proceed from there. But the plans were implemented through publication of re regulations. Okay. Uh, this gives you an idea of the, um, the, the fisheries that are affected by these take reduction plans. Uh, they're, um, there are still a couple of them that are, that are in the process, and the ones that have been developed have, um, uh, have constantly been uh, scrutinized and changed to, to deal with the interactions that, that are recognized as they're, they're uh, carried out. Uh, there have been um, nine take reduction teams that, that, have, that have been set up, and uh, they have made made some um, some progress. I guess the the when, if you go through the pros and cons of the uh, take reduction team process, I guess the the very first thing you always have to recognize is is just the importance of having this kind of consensus building approach, and the input of a range of interests, uh, including the uh, everybody from the fishermen to the the. Uh, public interest groups and uh, the regulators, the scientific community, academics, everyone that, that, that's involved. Um, the fishermen, of course, adding really important insights and problem solving skills to, to the process. And from the perspective of the NGOs and environmental groups, very important to actually put them in the problem solving process uh, in this situation. In some cases, the, the, the take reduction plans have uh, shown significant reductions in, in marine mammal mortality. Um, uh, you probably can't, can't read all that, but you can at least see that things are going down, okay. uh, at least in a number of, of fisheries. The, um, the bycatch in certain fisheries has gone down a, a great deal. The, uh, in the western uh, stock of the stellar sea lions, uh, not too many years ago, there were hundreds of thousands being taken into fisheries, and now it's down to a few dozen a year. Uh, southern sea otters and monk seals have also been reduced significantly. Unfortunately, there's a big list of cons, too, though. Um, there, uh, the, the, the data and information to be able to, to carry out this process is still uh, very insufficient. Uh, but even with the data that they have, the studies have shown that, that there are at least uh, 30 marine mammals uh, that would qualify as strategic stocks now with the information we have, but uh, there's still at least a dozen of those that aren't covered. Uh, quite a number of reasons why, uh, why they aren't. Um, there are still a lot of stocks out there that there simply isn't enough information to know about whether they're strategic stocks or not. Um, Many of the uh, take reduction teams, you know, no, uh, NIMPS were not exactly proactive about. There had to be lawsuits or threatened lawsuits before the teams were established. And most of the take reduction plans have not been developed on schedule by, by the teams. Um, the, I think the best has been anywhere like from three months late to as much as five years late. Um, there's also been criticism because there's no, been no good strategy for assessing the effectiveness of take reduction plans. They, uh, there's also criticism that the approach is largely inefficient, that uh, tax on specific bycatch policy, in other words, species by species, stock by stock policy, uh, disregards that there uh, are many bycatch issues that overlap. Uh, an, a notable, notable exception to that, though, has been the Mid-Atlantic uh, gillnet fishery, where the provisions for protection of bottlenose dolphins uh, also works for protecting sea turtles as well. Um, the Atlantic large whale take reduction team has been extremely ineffective as far as protection of the right whale. The Marine Mammal Commission recommends disbanding that uh, take reduction team and instead uh, putting in a small scientific advisory body instead. 
Um, some commentators also suggest that you know, the priorities are all wrong, that they, the species that have gotten, the, or the stocks that have gotten the most attention are the ones that interfere the most with human activity rather than prioritizing the stocks by the, the level of uh, uh, threat to those stocks. Um, a few other uh, critiques that uh, the Marine Mammal Commission has pointed out, they, they think that stock assessments could be improved considerably uh, and would like to see PBR incorporate uh, risk factors other than just fisheries interaction. Uh, they say that ecosystem-based management is eventually going to need info about all of the, the threats to these species in order to balance the risk factors. Uh, they have also had specific concerns about the Gulf of Mexico, that the stock assessments for the dolphins in, this, in the Gulf of Mexico haven't, haven't been carried out, and the classification of fisheries there uh, hasn't been carried out significantly. Uh, the Marine Mammal Commission also uh, asked for a more organized approach to the observer programs uh, because the data concerning uh, and the reliability of uh, take estimates depends on a well done program. How far over am I? I didn't see or hear you say five minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but they, uh, this is, I think this is it. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, but that, so there have been uh, some success, um, not in five years, and they, uh, but there, there's still a long way to go as far as uh, balancing the issues of protecting protected species with the fisheries interactions and fisheries management. Because you're not doing a PowerPoint yet. I'm not. When the uh, judges start letting me use PowerPoint, I'll use it all the time. <laughs> um, as some of you, uh, or as you heard earlier, um, unlike many you'll hear today, uh, I am in private practice. I work primarily for the fishing industry. Um, when I went to law school, I said, this is going to be wonderful. I'm going to go into maritime law. I'm going to be a proctor in admiralty. I took my admiralty courses. I learned, you know, maritime liens. I learned uh, how to do vessel seizures. I learned some really great things. But apparently my uh, law school textbook was missing a few chapters because as I came to represent the commercial fishing fleet, I discovered that there were actually a few simple little statutes and administrative rules and regulations that I uh, was unaware of. Uh, so for those of you, just as a preface, for those of you who consider a career in, in uh, maritime law and think about private practice, uh, before you leave law school, I strongly urge you to take as many administrative law courses as you possibly can. Uh, the, and, and I'm serious. I'm serious. <laughs> take them. I, they were terribly boring. I, I did have a great professor. <laughs> I had a great professor. They were really boring at the time, but you know, you get into those like Schechter poultry cases and, and uh, learn administrative deference, and, uh, and suddenly you have a whole new appreciation for the practical implications of man's interaction with his own government. Uh, we're here really on MSA issues, and I'm, I, my intention is to kind of give you the view from the uh, industry side of the equation. Um, MSA is, in many respects, a wonderful act. I've read it many times and kind of wondering why we have such kind of bizarre results. Uh, when the act really seems to be uh, focused on restoring fisheries, uh, encouraging a vital industry, uh, ensuring the, the viability of fishing communities, and really, most importantly, of providing a high quality, natural, uh, protein to feed both our nation and to the extent we choose to import it other nations. Uh, often we see that as the result of the confluence of many of these uh, other regulations and statutes, that goal is seldom achieved. Um, 
the section that we're looking at today is really to look at environmental statutes that, and, and how they converge around Magnuson. Um, and, and some of the statutes, and some aren't strictly environmental, that we see, obviously, you know the Magnuson Act, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Endangered Species Act. Uh, we're now seeing implications of the Clean Water Act with regard to vessel discharges. Uh, the Lacey Act, which really we see in its punitive aspects as applied to fisheries or um, other uh, illegally obtained uh, materials under MMPA and ESA. Uh, during the f we also interact frequently with the Atlantic Tunas Convention Act, which is a kind of parallel act. Uh, tunas and swordfish, I'm sure you guys all know this, are managed under an international uh, scheme known as the Atlantic Tunas Convention Act. Um, the U.S. administers its domestic policies through uh, kind of uh, through the act provisions but also in accordance with Magnuson principles. It's not done through a fishery management council. Those rules are made by the fishery service itself acting in conjunction with its highly migratory species uh, panels. Uh, we also have to deal with transboundary stock agreements, particularly in the Northeast multi-species. We do share um, some stocks on the Hague line with um, our 51st state up there, who got away from us at one point. Um, and then for the, the average boat owner, we're starting to see um, new, we have fishing vessel safety regulations. We're about to see a whole new set. In fact, I think they, um, the legislation was reach, recently signed. And we've had all sorts of new regulations um, by FDA under uh, HACCP requiring handling and storage of, um, of fish product as well as uh, new rules governing their importation and export. Uh, so it is a, it really is an alphabet soup of new regulatory requirements. Um, certainly in the last 30 years, the fishing industry has undergone more rapid uh, regulatory process than any other um, any other industry and although I'm not sure it's still true uh, four or five years ago I saw a study that said that actually the uh, fishery service uh, was second only to the IRS in promulgating new regulations and if you look at the number of regulations we see um, as previous speakers have commented they're considerable uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, um, the Magnuson Act and how it relates to the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, and, and at the end of it, we'll get back to the issue of, of what NOAA is doing um, on that right now. Uh, Magnuson obviously is a, uh, an environmental act at its very basis. Uh, it's become more and more so as time has gone on. Um, included in Magnuson is a long series of uh, regulatory requirements for rulemaking, which set forth deadlines for uh, public comment. Uh, they create the management councils. For those of you who don't know, the management councils are uh, both obligatory and appointed members. Uh, some members of the government, including NOAA, the Coast Guard. Uh, and, and these councils, you, uh, I have to stand up for the process a little bit because it kind of got misunderstood here. The council process, contrary to popular belief, is a very public process. Uh, there is a panel that makes a decision. Issues are sent out for scoping before uh, the, the uh, council actually starts to draft fishery management plans or amendments or frameworks. Uh, not frameworks, uh, but fishery management plans or amendments. Uh, the public is uh, offered opportunities to sit on advisory councils, to attend advisory council meetings, most uh, fishery management plans are governed by uh, subcommittees of the council, a scallop committee, a ground fish committee. The public is uh, welcome to attend those meetings, offer public comment. Uh, the results of, of those cumulative meetings are brought back to council uh, where once again the public is offered opportunity to comment very often. Uh, as, the, as the process proceeds, and I'll go through quickly in a few minutes how the last scallop amendment proceeded. Uh, at various times, the public is invited to public hearings. Uh, sometimes they're actually listened to. They're encouraged to submit written comments. Uh, 
and ultimately the process results in a product that may not be um, uh, accepted by all, but as a practical matter, it, it's really tough. I, I, everybody complains about the process, particularly when they don't like the result. But as a practical matter, um, I can't imagine how we could fashion a process that would afford more public input. At the same time, uh, in, the, in the Northeast, and I work mostly uh, in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, in the Northeast, particularly, our Fishery Management Council does, in fact, include uh, one a member of an environmental group, another member who of a fisheries group that's closely tied to environmental groups. We have a pretty good swath of, of public. We don't have John Q. Public sitting on the council, uh, but then again, the, the concept of a fishery management council is to provide that degree of experience um, to the agency at the council level that will benefit the agency. And it really doesn't make sense to put somebody on there who has no idea about any issue that's currently in front of them. From the, to, to, uh, uh, to talk about the commercial interests on the council, clearly when you're rulemaking, uh, you need to hear from those people who, who you are directly regulating as to how it is going to affect them. There's little expertise in NOAA as to the operation of fishing gear, uh, different types of fishing gear, uh, variations in fisheries among regions. So it's very important that that type of expertise come to the, come to the council process and be available for the agency throughout the process. The uh, National Environmental Policy Act, for those of you, uh, obviously anybody who works for the government knows what NEPA is. Um, it, it sounds a little more intimidating in some respects than it is. And NEPA really is, uh, arises from legislation in the 1960s, uh, as I understand it, relating, following up on a, uh, the, the Santa Barbara oil spill. And really the intent was to force administrative agencies to fully review the effect of their actions on the human environment, to determine um, what impact this virtually any federal action was going to have. The act requires public input throughout the throughout rulemaking process, requires that agencies can uh, consider a range of a reasonable range of alternatives. Um, and so it kind of in some respects parallels many of the requirements in the Magnuson Act. Uh, the problem is that both sets of requirements currently apply. Um, and, and as you sit and go through a, a, a current Magnuson uh, fishery management plan amendment, for example, we recently went through a, an amendment to deal with certain, with, with some of the uh, 2006 uh, requirements of the uh, Magnuson-Stevens Reauthorization Act to implement annual catch measures uh, and accountability measures. That process, which sounds pretty simple, we're going to put a cap on how much you can land and how much is it, uh, that process actually ended up taking about three and a half years. Uh, so there is a distinct and perceived need to find some way to speed up the process. Now, NEPA is actually a requirement of the uh, promulgating agency, which would be NOAA, and of course, under Magnuson, we have this kind of hybrid where, uh, where the fishery management councils are responsible really for developing the plan and submitting it to NOAA for kind of the, and I use NOAA and NIMFS interchangeably, for the thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, because of the, the problems created by this kind of dual time schedule, uh, around the time of the Magnuson Reauthorization Act, uh, there was significant pressure put on Congress to find some way to reconcile this. And so in the Magnuson Reauthorization Act, uh, there is a requirement that NIMFS uh, or NOAA come up with a method to kind of streamline the process and see if we can actually um, implement things faster while still preserving the whole concept of reasonable alternatives, uh, public involvement, um, and, and really understanding how uh, the government actions will affect the human environment. Uh, and so NIMFS a few years ago, I think it was in 2008, published um, some proposed rules. They went through a basic scoping process. Uh, those proposed rules, and maybe as a panelist I'll get to ask a question of, of NOAA as to when we expect something to happen um, on that front. 
Um, and and their, their proposed rules, I haven't, been, I haven't fully analyzed them. I've reviewed them at times. And, and, and it certainly seems that there is an advantage to having the NEPA process, which is a scoping public process, incorporated fully into the Fishery Management Council process and speeding it through. Uh, in the last round of the Scallop FMP, um, we did, as I indicated, uh, there was uh, really a non-controversial measure, which was to, um, to develop the annual catch limits specified in the 2006 reauthorization. Uh, but also kind of piggybacked on that was a very controversial measure to um, consolidate the scallop fishery. And the scallop fishery, uh, for those of you who watch fisheries, has been a very successful fishery. Owners are kind of making record profits. Uh, one of the problems, if it is a problem, is that abundance of scallops has risen to the point that uh, they're actually catching them so quickly, boats now catch in 90 days what they used to catch in 300 days. And so the question is, do we want to consolidate and create a bunch of uh, you know, super boats that uh, the, the numbers are something like the average scallop boat owner makes a $300,000 a year profit on his boat. Do you want to allow people to double up and triple up, or do you want to uh, preserve the small boat identity? And, and there are many social implications. The, um, the, the uh, environmental impact statement, which um, really the, the, the council puts together with the assistance of NOAA, in this case really did evaluate the impact of that and how it was going to affect the social environment. Social and economic interests are part of the human environment. And the result was that it really, there was a fairly strong indication that it was going to disrupt the traditional concept of small business fisheries. I'm not going to say small boat. The council um, in November of 2009 uh, actually voted to proceed with the consolidation provisions and the EIS environmental impact statement, or back then the draft environmental impact statement, uh, really became kind of a rallying point for the public who had been coming to meetings uh, to come back to the council and coherently argue that the documents within the plan themselves indicated that this would run contrary to social interests and particular interests raised in the Magnuson National Standards. Now again, NEPA is not a um, NEPA is not outcome determinative, it's a procedural statute which requires the agency go through certain hoops uh, while rulemaking, uh, which normally would be fodder for attorneys, but at this point, as we see it, there's very little NEPA litigation involving NOAA because they have NEPA teams, they have NEPA attorneys, and they seem to move the process through. But as a practical matter, uh, through three and a half tortured years of rulemaking, which required constant vigilance by the industry, the public environmental groups, at the end, the NEPA process proved, or the Magnuson combined NEPA process proved, that the council process really does have, um, does have an opportunity for individuals and the public to become involved in the process. So I, I don't want to belabor it too much, but I, I I take some umbrage to the concept that the council process is an exclusive process for people within the industry. It really isn't. Okay. Uh, just to touch on a couple other uh, brief issues, the, uh, and, and how some of these statutes do converge, and I'm just going to jump to one issue, which is, um, which is the enforcement issue. Um, and, and some of you had heard uh, recently uh, mentioned here that a recent investigation by the Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Commerce uh, harshly criticized uh, the Office of NOAA Law Enforcement, uh, really because in many respects they blurred the lines between criminal and civil prosecutions. The Magnuson Act has uh, very distinct protections against criminal prosecution. It really favors civil prosecution, only allows criminal prosecution in one or two instances. Uh, that's contrary to the provisions in the Endangered Species Act. Uh, as one fisherman in Massachusetts recently discovered, uh, after f trying to free a, uh, a right whale from his gill net, uh, trying to free a right whale from a gill net is a federal uh, misdemeanor and actually can be a fel felony. Uh, 
Similarly, MMPA also provides uh, criminal uh, sanctions, as does the Lacey Act. Um, and the difficulty that developed with the Office of Law Enforcement is that they brought in a lot of criminal investigators, in part converting civil investigators to criminal investigators. The, um, the end result was that fishermen felt that they were kind of being lumped into the same group. Uh, fines began to escalate. Um, log, uh, logbook page being late by a day was a $10,000 fine. So, um, and, and where I'm going with this is at the end of this, the question is going to be, should we lump these all together under one statute? And my answer would be, other than bringing NEPA and MSA together, I would strongly recommend against it. Thank you. lights up and I, I don't know if I'm going to use this much, but uh, I didn't do a whole lot of slides, but we'll, we'll keep them on just in case. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about the National Environmental Policy Act as well, and I think I'm going to sort of focus in on that for my um, discussion today. When we, we had a call to, to talk about the panel beforehand, and Susan had mentioned, well, it might be interesting, and Stephen and Dana can do sort of a, a point counterpoint on, on NEPA, since they're both going to talk about it a little bit, and uh, listening to Stephen talk, I, I don't think that we really do a point and counterpoint. I think we're, we're both in really very similar, take very similar positions in that we, we see the real benefits that NEPA affords the process. I was really interested in that scallop story because, yes, it does show the success of the council process, but a lot of that success happened, and the good decisions that come out are because of the requirements of the National Environmental Policy Act that, that overlay the Magnuson process. So I, I, I think that's a good success story for NEPA. Um, one of the, the big points I'm going to make here today is that NEPA, if, if applied correctly, can really be the best tool for effective and, and forward-thinking fisheries management, which leads to healthier ecosystems, which in turn can actually lead to more abundant and, and healthy fisheries. I don't think it's a separation of either we, we, we continue to fish and have have productive fisheries or we protect the environment. In fact, I think we can, we can do both and NEPA helps get us there. I'm going to give a, a quick snapshot of NEPA. Stephen talked about it a little bit, so I'll try not to be too repetitive. Um, then I'll give a picture of how it, it, it intersects with the Magnuson Act. I'm just going to make a couple quick suggestions for where there's room for improvement and, and a couple things we might do to fix it. Um, let's see, my first slide. Can I use this one? Sorry, guys. Let's. It's really not that important, actually. <laughs> oh, I wasn't pointing it in the right place. Okay, so Congress passed uh, the National Environmental Policy Act in 1969 as the basic national charter for protection of the environment. It has two sort of overarching objectives, and one is that federal agencies have to take a, a transparent and thoughtful look at the decisions uh, that they make. They have to look at a number of alternatives, and they need to give the public an opportunity to view those actions before they're taken. Very broadly, the law requires that federal agencies use, I think this is where I have a, a slide up here, use an interdisciplinary approach to decision making. For purposes of the Magnuson Act, the, the federal agency, it is the, it's the Department of Commerce through NOAA, through the National Marine Fisheries Service, that ultimately is, is on the legal hook for complying with NEPA. Uh, the law requires that for every major federal action significantly affecting the quality of the human environment, every one of us who has taken environmental law classes has basically gets this memorized forever, um, agencies must include a detailed statement of the environmental effects of the proposed action and of all alternatives, um, and the statement must be made available to the public. Uh, this is the EIS, or the Environmental Impact Statement, which is really the main vehicle for achieving the congressional purposes of, of NEPA. Quickly, there are three key elements to, um, to an EIS. Yeah, I don't think I did very many slides here. One is the alternatives analysis. This is really the heart of the EIS. And what this means is that the agency cannot restrict its analysis to just 
to just one option. It can't sort of say this is what we're going to do and then do a quick analysis of how to get there. They need to look at a range of alternatives in different ways to achieve the purpose of the stated action. Um, next is the requirement to consider a range of environmental effects. This in includes um, of all these actions and alternatives. This includes cumulative, cumulative impacts. So that means don't just look at what would happen from this action, but what are the effects from decisions we've made before and ongoing management schemes and, and what do we think could happen in the future? And this is really where sort of the ecosystem-based management benefit of NEPA can come into play. Finally, there's the requirement to provide the public a meaningful opportunity to review the alternatives and its consequences and to have their views considered by the agency. Uh, ideally, agencies can take advantage of this opportunity that NEPA provides to think broadly and to consider approaches, uh, multiple approaches and innovative approaches to the issue at hand. Um, for fisheries management, for instance, this would mean looking at, at different ways to get at fisheries management um, beyond looking at just one quota versus or another or one tack of total allowable catch or what we're now calling ACLs or annual catch limits um, under the law. So between the interdisciplinary approach required by NEPA, the alternatives analysis, the requirement to look at the cumulative effects of decisions, uh, NEPA really provides fishery management managers the opportunity to add ecosystem-based management principles to a regime that alone, under the Magnuson Act, really is geared toward just a single use, which is fishing. Um, NEPA and the MSA serve distinct but complementary purposes. Um, there are some key benefits that NEPA adds on top of the Magnuson Act. The Magnuson does have, obviously, very strong conservation requirements, and I could sit up here for an hour and talk about the great new benefits of science-based catch limits and accountability measures, but NEPA does add benefits that are not necessarily included in the Act, and really these include the um, requirement to look at other alternatives besides just the one at hand. It includes the cumulative impact analysis, and the, up, and the requirement that agencies actually respond to comments from the public. I should probably get moving. I, I have a lot of um, material. Um, I want to talk about the, the challenge then that NEPA um, provides in the, in the Magnuson context. NEPA has made, or NEPA, NIMS has made some, some good strides in improving this process because it, it has been criticized over the years for being, um, I think Steve used the word, um, jumping through hoops, and, and it's, it's a paperwork burden. And I've, I think we'd have to concede that, that some litigation over the years has, has created some concerns, and we've created what we sometimes call the thud factor, very giant EISs, and this feeling like we need to jump through a lot of hoops in order to meet the requirements. And they're making a, a lot of progress in, in addressing these problems, but there are, um, we're still facing challenges. I'm gonna talk about just sort of two broad context for the challenges um, in NEPA and MSA. First are these sort of procedural hoops um, or procedural inefficiencies and timing issues. Stephen mentioned um, under the Magnuson Act, the councils are tasked with uh, producing fishing management measures, fishing, fishery management recommendations, and then they send it on to the agency. At that point, the agency has the option to either approve it or disapprove it or partially approve it. Um, and for the most part, as long as the, the recommendations are consistent with the Act, they approve it. Very rarely does an FMP, well, FMPs are completed, but very rarely do amendments get sent back down to the councils. Um, but since NIMS is the agency that is on the hook legally for NEPA compliance, the NEPA provisions and requirements technically do not kick in until they've received that proposal from the council. So therefore, as a result, the council has made a decision it's sent on to the agency, and then the NEPA process kicks in, which essentially renders the requirements of NEPA meaningless. Again, some, some steps have been made to try and address this issue. I put up here just some additional authorities um, for carrying out MSA and NEPA, and within these authorities, one is a NOAA administrative order that tells NOAA how to apply NEPA. Um, the NIMS operational guidelines for conducting the Magnuson Act also has some guidance for conducting NEPA and then at the council level, the councils have their own procedures for carrying out fishing decisions, and all these do provide some guidance for how to parallel these two systems so that the NEPA documentation and the MSA documentation can be done at the same time. And some councils have made some really good progress in fixing that up. NIMS has made some progress in helping them along. Um, but 
it doesn't happen um, consistently all the time. Quickly, I'd mention the Pacific Council, for instance, this summer, they did a, a big amendment, Amendment 23, to their ground fish fishery, which was intended to implement the new Magnuson requirements for catch limits and accountability measures. And this is a big amendment. This is something that could change the way the ground fish fishery is, is managed and hopefully make improvements to the way it's managed. Um, but they basically developed it, approved it, sent it on to NIMPS before there was any um, NEPA assessment done at all, which again just sort of render, rendered the requirements of NEPA not quite so useful in that situation. Um, so it's important that we improve the procedural inefficiencies and some of the loopholes that are inherent in this process, but fishery managers, managers also need to expand their thinking about how NEPA can facilitate a more holistic examination of the marine environment. This is the second challenge in, in implementing NEPA, and, and really it's sort of a, a lost opportunity over the years. Overall, the Magnuson Act doesn't provide a mechanism for considering the effects of fishery management decisions on the entire infected environment. Rather, it's, it's focused on the effects of the particular fishery management decision. Currently, NEPA provides the only tool for doing that. Um, today we could have a, an entire, not today, I think over a couple of days we could we could do an entire symposium on what ecosystem-based management for fisheries means. So I'm just going to give a brief description of um, what we mean when we say ecosystem-based manager. Ecosystem-based management is that decisions should be made with a full understanding of the impacts of particular fishing strategies on, on all the components of the marine ecosystem. Um, the goal is to maintain that ecosystem in a healthy and productive um, conditions so that it can provide the services that humans want and need, which in includes commercial and recreational fisheries. Um, we need to take these broad looks early on in the fisheries as well and periodically thereafter. Um, the famous stellar sea lion case, which is Greenpeace v. NIMPS, paints a vivid portrait of the need for these sort of big, broad, programmatic looks early on in the fishery. I'm just going to talk about this case. I, see, I told you I just kind of forgot about my PowerPoint. Oh, no, okay. Well, quickly, the stellar sea lion case. <laughs> um, actually, um, this has some ESA um, concerns, but also th as from a NEPA standpoint, this was a groundbreaking case because it basically the, um, set the, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, this set a precedent for using these ecosystem-based management tools for um, making fisheries decisions. In this situation, uh, the um, ground fish fisheries in Alaska had been, been based on an EIS that had been done about 20 years previously to the lawsuit. Um, in that time, the fishery had changed uh, in, in you know, sort of breathtaking ways, including the stellar sea lion was listed as an, and first threatened, and then a uh, western population was listed as threatened. And so Greenpeace challenged the, the ground fish fishery um, under NEPA, as, among other claims, um, with the claim that the, the, this, the EIS was too narrow. Um, NIMS had come back and um, done a supplemental impact statement, but just focused in on, on fishery, um, on catch levels and tax. Um, and the court came back and said, you know, in fact, you can't just look at the tax. You need to do a programmatic look. You need to look at the cumulative effects. And this really set a, a, a great precedent for ecosystem-based management and fisheries. Um, and unfortunately, it really hasn't taken off. Um, this is not something that's trickled down to other regions. And I ran out of time. So that, I'm just going to skip to some of the needed improvements. Stephen talked about the rulemaking. Um, the stellar sea lion case was, was something that came up a lot during that reauthorization process. Trying to sync up NEPA with the Magnuson Act um, became one of the really focal, focal points of reauthorization. At one point there was some provisions in some of the iterations of legislation to basically exempt the Magnuson Act and fortunately um, in the end that, that aspect of the legislation was replaced with this one to just um, tell the agency to streamline the process. Um, Mr. Schwab is here. Unfortunately, the, the original rulemaking came out before he was uh, at, at NIMP, so I can say that unfortunately the original rule that, that came out was, was uh, really kind of unacceptable from an environmental standpoint from, from really um, benefiting on NEPA. And it also, I, I, I don't want to speak for the fishing industry, but wasn't really acceptable to folks who had been finding NEPA to be burdensome. It, it kind of took away the really important ecosystem aspects of NEPA and then also put in new procedural hurdles and, and made the process even more complicated. So I think what we need to do going forward 
Um, NIMS is about three years past their deadline for doing this required rulemaking under the reauthorization. Um, but if they do a rulemaking, and even if they don't, I think they can do this under um, current law and under current regulations, I think that we could use um, more guidelines on how to take this programmatic idea, this idea of a programmatic EIS, an ecosystem-based management that was created in the Stellar Sea Lion case, and maybe we can get some more guidance on how we can carry that through at the regional level. Um, the, the regulations do allow programmatic EISs with tiering, but I think that the, the, the regions are really struggling with how to do that. And then we do also, of course, need to address some of these procedural and timing issues so that, one, we don't have this feeling like they're jumping through hoops and doing a lot of paperwork just to, uh, just to meet the requirements of the law. Um, and I think it will instill a lot more confidence in management as well. And we want to make sure that the councils aren't making their decisions without the benefits of NEPA. I want to close real quickly by just saying, um, you know, I think we all want the same thing. I'll go back to that point counterpoint that, that um, people sometimes set up between the fishing industry and environmentalists. And really, we do all want the same thing, which are vibrant fisheries and the, uh, the, the coastal and fishing communities that rely on them. And, and NEPA, if applied correctly, and done to benefit the, the, the overall environment, I think will produce more vibrant fisheries for the future. Sorry for going over. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Susan, and thank you, Josh, for the uh, invitation to come and talk to you this afternoon. Uh, coming from Juneau, Alaska, where it rains all the time, I feel up front uh, compelled to offer an apology for bringing our weather with me. So I hope you will forgive me from the start. Uh, I come from a background of ecology and uh, science. And I am not a lawyer, um, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about some of the management aspects of implementing the Magnuson-Stevens Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Marine Mammal, Concert, uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And the latter two, the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act, with uh, one small exception for subsistence harvest by Alaska Natives, are really acts of conservation for non-consumptive consumptive value. So we are not looking at harvesting these species that are protected in the marine environment under these two acts. We are looking at the conservation for the value of conservation. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, the concept of ecosystem management that is something that has been around for a while in idea and perhaps um, implemented in, in varying degrees of success in practice. So I'd, I'm going to touch just a little bit on some of the um, uh, premises of those acts and uh, some specifics of the Endangered Species Act and then perhaps try to uh, let you answer the question about how ecosystem management might actually work in practice. So I'm going to start with a couple of overarching policies and the recent uh, issuance of President Obama's ocean policy. Um, one of the overarching objectives is to adopt ecosystem-based management as a foundational principle for the comprehensive management of the ocean, our coasts, and the Great Lakes. So you can see this uh, setting us on a path perhaps of implementing actually in practice ecosystem-based management. Two other reports, the Pew Commission report and the Ocean Commission report are also looking at that idea of institutionalizing ecosystem considerations in policy management. So looking specifically at the intersection of the Magnuson-Stevens Act with the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act, how do these laws currently address ecosystem consideration? Do the laws intersect? And are we actually in practice taking an ecosystem approach to the management of fisheries and apex predators? Now, uh, with the caveat that I'm not 
a lawyer, I'm going to plunge boldly into talking about some of the aspects of these laws. You've heard a lot today already, and you know um, from your own experiences the Magnuson-Stevens Act, Act and the purposes of that um, stated there uh, in general to conserve and manage the fishery resources off the coast of the United States by exercising sovereign rights for the purposes of exploring, exploiting, conserving, and managing all fish within the exclusive economic zone. One of the national standards, the primary national standard, looks at achieving optimum yield from the fish in the nation's waters. One of the discretionary provisions, and the bolds are mine, um, indicates that we may, I don't know if you can see the bottom of that, so I'll just read it, but may include management measures in the plan to conserve target and non-target species and habitats, and then here from my own emphasis, considering the variety of ecological factors affecting fishery populations. So what does that mean when we're putting the practice of fisheries management into action? That practice is really a, a one of maximum yield for single species stock management for fish populations. And there's a quote here that I won't read all of from Dan Goodman, who is a population biologist um, well known for working in, in some of these uh, population fields. And he notes here that there are no quantitative standards or specific decision rules for these latter considerations of um, ecology, except as imposed from outside by, in some cases, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, or by the Endangered Species Act, or the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So how does the Magnuson Act consider the ecosystem? In my experience, obviously draws mainly from Alaska, but in, uh, so I'm not that familiar with the other fishery management council uh, arenas or processes, but in Alaska, the ecosystem um, committee of the council is fairly active. The process of developing stock assessment reports for the fisheries as stocks that are managed by the council includes an ecosystem chapter. That chapter uh, deals in quite a large extent and hefty volumes of um, information about factors in the ecosystem that affect fish and the fish stocks that are managed. They are looking primarily at things that impact directly the stock that's of commercial value and harvestable uh, and, and not necessarily the broad range of things that, are, are exam that could be examined in the ecosystem, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. One of the other th considerations in the North Pacific Fishery Management Council is a prohibition on fishing for the forage fish complex or the small fishes of the ocean that the commercially viable species feed off of. Um, also in uh, the Pacific, there's the similar consideration for krill, again, another forage species for um, the commercially viable fisheries. There has been a new effort in the North Pacific Fishery Management Council to prohibit fishing in the Arctic, uh, a new FMP that basically um, does not allow any fishing. In some regards, it could be considered a bit as a preemptive strike um, until we see what happens as the Arctic starts to open up and exploration perhaps for fishing opportunities may occur in the northern reaches of um, U.S. waters. So in general, these actions are really non-specific actions focused at or below the trophic level of the fish species that are harvested for commercial value. So let's move to the Marine Mammal Protection Act, just touch on that one briefly because I'd like to get a little bit more into the Endangered Species Act. But in the Marine Mammal Protection Act, you can see the concept of ecosystems and ecosystem management coming into play there too in the findings of Congress in authorizing this act. And under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, there is a recognition that certain species of, of marine mammals and stocks may de be depleted by uh, man's activities and the desire to protect these species as significant functioning elements of the ecosystem, maintaining them at the optimum sustainable population. And as was mentioned earlier, that's kind of a, a, an, um, 
maximum sustainable yield concept, though of course it's not for the exploitation purposes, but again for the conservation value that these species bring to the environment. Moving in to look um, at the tenets of the Endangered Species Act, again we see this concept of ecosystems and the value of ecosystems that are um, highlighted by the purpose of the Endangered Species Act to provide a means whereby the ecosystems upon which endangered and threatened species depend may be conserved. Um, one other point of note in the authorization of the um, Endangered Species Act is that Congress charged federal agencies, federal departments with conserving endangered species, uh, util utilizing all of their authorities to do so. In particular, under Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act, there are two primary parts there that we, for example, as a federal agency, when we are um, charged with uh, conserving and protecting endangered species under the ESA, must consider on the management side of the agency responsible for those species, but also on the action side of the agency for the prosecution of federal fisheries. So Section 71 of the Endangered Species Act um, puts forth that agencies shall, shall utilize their authorities in the furtherance of the purposes of this act by carrying out programs for the conservation of these species. So it's really a proactive element of the act that says that we need to get out there and do these things as federal agencies to promote uh, this conservation value. Section 7A2 um, brings to bear that any agency that a federal agency that conducts an action that may affect uh, a listed species is required to consult with the agency that has jurisdiction over those species in the marine environment. For the most part, that's uh, no fisheries except for a few species um, overseen by the Fish and Wildlife Service. So under this uh, provision of Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act, the National Marine Fisheries Service, NOAA Fisheries, looks at um, consultations for federal fisheries actions. These actions are ongoing actions, uh, generally reauthorized on an annual basis. So they have been in place for some time, obviously, and they are continuing with whatever modifications that may be uh, promulgated through regulations or through fishery management plan implementations. So the consultations happen on a periodic basis when new information indicates that there may be a new impact. So it's not every time that a new regulation is promulgated or a new FMP is put into place. And so the challenge under Section 7A2 of the Endangered Species Act is to modify the fishery if that fishery jeopardizes the continued existence of the listed species or adversely modifies or destroys critical habitat. Um, there's a slight nuance there, but I'm not going to get into the, too many of the details here. I just want to give you a picture of this um, requirement. <coughs> So the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act um, both recognize the conservation value of uh, these species. Um, they have different standards and different mechanisms for addressing that aspect. So how well does ecosystem management work in practice? I would put forth that fisheries management has moved to include ecosystem management to the extent that is an improved single species models for fish, but it is not necessarily considered the apex predators who may feed on commercially viable species, that it can also be considered nodal species or keystone species that transfer energy up and down the food chain. So can we do this in a different way and perhaps a better way by considering the um, upfront uh, challenge that we have under Section 7A1 to do what we can to ensure that these actions don't impact uh, listed species. Maybe we can do this under the Marine Mammal Protection Act for, the, for looking at the standard of optimum sustainable populations. Uh, I won't go into that too much because that um, creates 
perhaps a, a clash between the maximum sustainable yield of a fishery and the so-called maximum sustainable um, population or yield of apex predators, but that may be an option. Uh, I put forth that under the Endangered Species Act, however, the agencies can use their authorities furtherance of conservation activities by um, including upfront in our stock assessment models, for example, explicit requirements for consideration of these apex predators and think about the ways to do that in a proactive way rather than in a perhaps reactive way for fisheries that have ongoing management uh, activity that, have, that may be continuing over some period of time. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, uh, so uh, just to paraphrase the question that I think it's worth, is worth thinking about, it's sort of a broader version of the question that we faced after panel one. Uh, that question was, could we have a different or better fisheries management law if we started from the beginning? And here, I think the idea, we brought it out to say, really, we're looking at a, uh, a place or a, a, a set of places in the, in the ocean. Um, if we were going to start from scratch and say, how are we going to manage human use of those spaces? Is there some simpler or more effective uh, way that we might do that. Um, and I'll just leave it at that and uh, let the uh, panelists each give a short uh, maybe answer to that or thought about that question, and then we'll move on to some, some of your questions. Well, I, I'm on board with Kaya. I, I think that uh, we have to be going towards an ecosystem-based management approach. Um, and if we were starting from scratch, that that would be the way to go, to, to deal with all the marine living resources uh, under an ecosystem-based managed approach. The way we are going at it now, NEPA just is not an adequate surrogate for uh, ecosystem-based management. It's uh, because it's primarily procedural and uh, it lacks the substantive uh, requirements that we need for, for this. Uh, it's not enough. And the MSA provisions requiring uh, consideration of other stocks and bycatch uh, in, in their and the provisions uh, certainly aren't adequate surrogate for ecosystem-based management either. And uh, neither the MSA, the ESA, or the MMPA adequately address balancing the factors that need to be considered in an ecosystem-based management approach. They all narrowly look at the issues that are within their scope without uh, pulling the big picture together. So I would say, yes, pull them together. <laughs> Um, well, the, uh, it, it, in many respects, industry um, is somewhat concerned about the, the whole concept of doing an <coughs> ecosystem approach. Uh, one of the difficulties that we often have is that in trying to promulgate a, a fishery management plan or an amendment, we find ourselves butting heads with um, with ESA or MMPA or trying to resolve bycatch issues under the Atlantic Tunas Convention Act. Uh, and, and I do have to say that, uh, in my opinion, uh, we do need a better uh, method of um, understanding the complex interrelationships of all of the marine species every time we take an action. And it doesn't mean that we need to do a complete ground up consideration, but, but we certainly need better coordination so that we can understand the impact of uh, a decision which affects one stock and how, in turn, it may affect others. So I, I have to say that we certainly need much better coordination and a much bigger picture outlook on the environment. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd agree with, with, uh, with Kai and Donna, and I think Steve, it sounds like we're all sort of in agreement. I think we do, I'm, I'm a sort of a, I'm sort of a cheerleader. It's like the day, and it's a lot more than the first 
I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cheerleader for NEPA as this ecosystem-based management tool, but I, I, I agree with Donna that in the long run, it's, it's, it's not adequate. This is really absent and, and overarching um, ocean policy. So I, I know um, this is something we're working towards at, at Ocean Conservancy, and there's, there's different names. There's been different efforts years ago, not years ago, five years ago, four years ago, we worked on Oceans 21. I mean, there's been different efforts to to do overarching policies, and I think we're still sort of working out how that would work, but yes, I think uh, a bigger overarching law and policy um, is a good idea. I think this idea that, we're, that, we, that you do sort of end up butting heads with the Endangered Species Act and the Human Protection Act, it, it does happen, and um, the Stellar Sea Lion case is a good example of, of why if you have a, a more programmatic look and you do it early on in the life of the fishery and you do it periodically, you don't sort of have these train wrecks because you see them coming before the train wrecks start to happen. So something that creates and requires, not necessarily requires, but, but it encourages and makes sure that these early big, step, big steps back and, and programmatic um, examinations of the fishery happen early on would, would be necessary. I think without a good funding stream, a lot of this stuff won't work either. So I'm just going to throw in a, a, a pitch for um, Senator Whitehouse and Senator Snow's bill, the National Endowment for the Oceans, because without some good funding streams, um, a lot of the, the, any sort of thing we put in place might not be as effective. We're looking at trying to implement the new requirements of the Magnuson Act, science-based catch limits and accountability measures. And one of the challenges for that is getting good data. We have really good data in some places. We have maybe not as good data in others. And we definitely have an issue with stakeholders that don't have confidence in that data. So um, I think dedicated funding streams along with the overarching policy is, is critical. I guess my answer to that would be, question would be, in the simple version, yes, that it would be better to have some kind of overarching or integrated uh, component of these laws that look at responsibilities for management of different resources in the same environment. But I think, obviously, too, the devil is in the details, and I can think of some perhaps straightforward ways of doing um, the implementation of that in the science realm of, of, as I suggested, integrating a parameter into our stock assessment evaluations that includes these apex predators that is not just a function of the mortality component of, of the fishery stock assessment, but um, to actually go to the place of creating a, a statute, perhaps, that integrated these elements, uh, I, I, I think that needs some long, careful thought. In population genetics, there's the internal tension, as Jean was talking about, tensions this morning between the splitters and the lumpers. And there are two very distinct camps there of which way do you go if you're looking at a population. Is it, an, is it a small isolated population or is it a metapopulation that has different components to it and, and which is the better way to manage. Um, I, I think there's a parallel to be drawn there too perhaps with um, development of, of a new law that looks at the ocean environment. <coughs> I'm not sure I have the answer to that. Um, but I think in concept, creating some integration at least among these laws that are managing in an ecosystem that is interdependent uh, has to be part of the way we do it. Okay, um, got some time for some questions. Who has the first question? There we go. Usually, um, the, the promulgating agency is the fishery service. The, uh, the, the <coughs> rulemaking, I mean, the, the, the councils act in an advisory capacity, but they do actually assemble 
Um, they assemble a document, and they, they actually, within their um, environmental impact statements, because they do the EIS, they will normally have the range of alternatives. So that's where your alternatives would normally reside. The, the uh, fishery service does not then uh, take that and put it out. They, they do put it out for public comment, but they do not put it out with a range of alternatives for public comment. It's really locked in at that point. And, and that's, that's kind of where the interplay between MSA and NEPA um, can create, it could create some problems. Uh, but as a practical matter, once the, um, the EIS is prepared by the council, as it moves on, it becomes the agency's EIS if it's accepted. Okay. Could I just add to that? Sure. I, mean, just as it, I, I think to make it sort of straightforward, the, the action is the approval or the disapproval. And now an FMP, again, I'm mentioning stellar sea lion case, but that actually was one that said FMPs are sort of by their nature um, a major action. So they pretty much always, pretty much always have to have an EIS. Um, whether something is a major action um, under the fisheries management scheme, because there's all different things they do. They, the FMPs are basically done. That's not to say there aren't new ones. The Arctic FMP was a great new FMP. But for the most part, for the major fisheries, the FMPs have been done. What they do now are amendments, and those are the, those are the big kind of sweeping changes. Then there's framework actions and annual specifications where annually or every other year they'll, they'll set catch limits or they change measures. So there's a whole range, and some are big and some are small, and there's no bright line as to, well, there are bright lines in the law as to, to what warrants, but you, know, you can't say a framework gets an EIS you know, and a spec doesn't. But, so there's, there's a range of different actions, and it's case by case, the agency really has to decide whether NEPA applies. Unfor I don't want to say unfortunately, but I think confusedly, a lot of the burden is being put on the councils, and I think there's a very pertinent question as to whether that's an appropriate place to put the burden under NEPA. Um, but then, so the action is, whenever the recommendation is, whether it's an FMP amendment or um, a regulatory amendment, um, it's when NIPS takes that and says, yes, this is okay, or no, this isn't okay, that, that might be the action that triggers it. We had uh, an FMP on aquaculture in the Gulf. I might be remembering this wrong, but um, that FMP went, and that, that was a really broad look at, like, should we do aquaculture in the Gulf of Mexico? And that was challenged, and the court can come back and say, well, this isn't an action because nothing's happening yet. You're not actually doing anything. So I, I kind of have to backtrack on the FMPs, need an EIS. It's not... Uh, well, I'm talking, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of mixing things up because it might not necessarily raise to something that we could lodge a claim against or at least successfully. So, but that's the point when you, that the, the action occurs is when NIMS takes that recommendation and makes a decision. Yeah. Um, this is a question for Kaya. Uh, and I wonder if you could respond to David's uh, comment about the usefulness of the programmatic supplemental EIS on groundfish fisheries uh, in Alaska. I mean, how, how useful do you think that exercise really was in terms of informing fishery management decisions as they're being made today? Well, I used a lot of paper. <laughs> 7,000 pages. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I guess I'm... Um, I guess there's the, the perhaps politically correct answer to that, and there's you know another answer that may or may not be politically correct. I don't know, but I would say that realistically, yes, I think that was helpful. Um, I'm not sure that it needed 7,000 pages worth to make fisheries management better, but I think the exercise of going through an evaluation of what we do is, and I probably can't really speak for this since I don't. Um, work for our sustainable fisheries office but um, the exercise of going through looking at how we do fisheries management gave us um, a lot uh, more up close and personal view of that than maybe we would have as we sort of march through the things that we need to do to um, make fisheries work but um, uh, there's the interplay there of course too between the councils and, and the agency, and as obviously as was pointed out earlier today, um, the agency has 
restricted authorities in approving, disapproving, or partially approving or disapproving um, fisheries management policies that come from the council. So, um, you know, whether or not that document helped the councils is maybe a different question, too. Okay, we have another one back there. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. This is for the panel of gentlemen from Vander Ashton, Boston, Massachusetts. We discussed the concepts of marine spatial orientation and the ecosystem based management today. How would you say the two are related? Are they mutually exclusive, codependent, independent concepts? Okay, I'm going to repeat the question since I failed to do my duty for, <laughs> <laughs> for the last two. Um, this is a question about the relationship between ecosystem-based management and marine spatial planning, right? right? Yes, sir. Okay. For the, <laughs> and, it's, and it's for the panel. Well, well certainly the, 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 uh, uh, the, the President's announcement and the recommendations from the uh, Interagency Task Force um, saw them as, as totally related, that, that uh, marine spatial planning has to be based on uh, ecosystem management principles. So it, uh, it, the, the idea that you're going to plan um, and prioritize uses for areas without basing it on uh, a clear assessment of uh, the ecosystem requirements um, and as well as just human uses of the, of the area um, wouldn't be adequate. It has to, that's going to have to be a, a, a process that goes on together. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how you could divorce one from the other. Clearly, when it, it, if you're talking about, um, for lack of a better term, cutting the uh, um, cutting the ocean up into uh, developable lots. Uh, one would hope that you would have to take into account the effect it's going to have across the entire ecosystem. And whether it's, uh, it's oil drilling or wind power or uh, fisheries or marine transportation, I'm not sure how you could possibly um, do it for one use without considering its impact on uh, every other use and every other marine resource. I guess I'd just offer one thing there, um, uh, that in concept it seems to me that marine spatial planning might be a two, an exercise in two dimensions. And I think the ecosystem management concept is, is something that occurs in three dimensions. And I don't know if that's been um, how we think about putting those two things together. I think in principle, yes, they should be. Um, integrated, and I don't know how, I agree with Stephen, I'm not sure how you could te tease them apart, but um, the idea of drawing plots on an ocean is maybe not um, as comprehensive as um, the function of the, the ecosystem. And Morgan probably has it much be better. I must be also, and four-dimensional sometimes if you take time to Four dimensions of space, wow. That's, that's a lot to think about at this hour in the day. Good thing there's a reception soon. Um, before uh, I let you all clap, and then you're going to want to bolt, a couple of housekeeping announcements. So uh, those of you who need shuttle transportation to the reception or back to the Bristol Harbor Inn, there's a shuttle leaving as you exit the law school to the right. There's one at 440, 445. They'll wait for us, don't worry. Um, uh, going just to the Mount Hope Farm. Uh, then there's another one at five, which will go first to Mount Hope Farm and then down to the Bristol Harbor Inn. So that's for those of you attending tonight. Everybody should have one of these attractive, bright yellow evaluation forms. Please keep track of what you think of the event as we're proceeding here and turn them in when you depart. Uh, tomorrow morning we'll convene at nine o'clock. Join me in thanking our panel and moderator. <laughs>